everyone. Well, welcome to Heartland Baptist Church. This morning I'd like to welcome Patty and Kevin, Emily Seeley's parents from North Carolina. Welcome you here this morning. This morning I'm reading from uh, Psalm 90, verses 1 to 4. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. In his time, <clears throat> do you ever feel as though you don't get time? Some weeks are over before you know it, and other weeks seem to contain two or three Wednesdays. You can remember your fifth birthday party with the pony rides in vivid detail, but last Christmas seems so long ago. Time may be a measurement, but it will never give us a complete picture of our lives. God sees all time at once. He knows every moment as now. There is no such thing as being late in God's timeline. Everything is happening exactly when it should or at the perfect time. He sees the big picture, past, present, and future all at once. We will never understand this, but we can trust this. God gives us an opportunity to trust him every day, to believe that he has everything under control and nothing happens by accident. He uses everything in our lives, even time, to let us know that he has a plan for us. He gives us everything in his time. The next time you're, st you're stuck in traffic in the big town of Heartland and it's making you late, trust God enough to say, this is perfect. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for health and strength. We thank you, Lord, for those that's gathered in. We thank you for your word, for how it's been preserved down through the ages. How maybe someone in our family gave us a Bible when we were young. We just thank you for that, Lord, for your word. Bless it today as, Lord, uh, we come to hear your word. Think of the speaker today, Lord, strengthen him, encourage him. And Lord, watch over each one. Those that are at home, Lord, those that aren't able maybe to attend, but perhaps today they can watch us through the internet, the service today. I just pray you strengthen those shut-ins, encourage them, help them, Lord, to feel better soon. We just thank you, Jesus, for each one. We pray for the service today. Bless it, encourage us, and help us, Lord, to be an encouragement here and in every day in our lives and in our community. In your name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. The first song we're singing today is taken from Isaiah 40. It's Behold Our God. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? And who made him understand? Who taught him the path of judgment, justice, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? In Isaiah 40, 31 says, But they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Let's sing together, Behold Our God. Stand if you can and sit, sit when you want to. Thank you. 
1 Chronicles 29, 11 says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and in the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Let's sing together, How Great is Our God, and it goes into How Great Thou Art. Let's sing it like we mean it.
Good morning, everyone, and it's nice to see all of you here this morning, and uh, we're thankful to be able to be in the house of the Lord and to have all kinds of <coughs> things to keep us busy doing his work. And I just want to highlight a few announcements that are also in your bulletin, but just for you to take note of. Um, just a reminder about commotion happening uh, this Tuesday. And as well on Tuesday, Tuesday morning, our launch team is, has been meeting. So those of you who are involved with launch, uh, we are meeting at 10 a.m. And as well, there will be a Board of Christian Education meeting on Tuesday as well, so take note of that. On Wednesday, a couple of announcements. The, uh, what was the prayer and Bible study is now meeting as a small group in the Parsonage, so if you're looking for an opportunity to uh, study the Lord's uh, the scriptures, you can join Pastor Dan at the Parsonage, and as well, will be a new Bible study if you're interested. It is going to be happening at 10 Hawthorne Street. And if you know where that is, that's uh, where Nancy and I live. And Nancy's going to be leading this Bible study. It's a Max Lucado um, study, and it's his new book, Help is Here. So if you're interested in being part of that Bible study, just speak to Nancy, and um, we'll let you in on all the details. That's at 6.30 on Wednesday. On Thursday, the Board of Management will be meeting in the evening, and this meeting will be to look at the budget for next year. And on Saturday, um, any, of those, any of you who could be on hand to help at Greenwood Cemetery, it's a work day there, so many hands make light work. If you can help out at that, it would be greatly appreciated. And there is a fundraiser coming up for the ministerial. It's happening on November 6th. It's at the Wesleyan Church. And you know that uh, the ministerial is active in helping to support uh, folks who might be coming through town, who are people who might be needing some extra help. And this fundraiser helps uh, provide funds for that ministry. So if you could, November 6th, it should be a great night. And on Wednesday, November 23rd, is our fall business meeting. So please mark your calendars for that. And there are other announcements in the bulletin, and uh, please feel free to take a good, strong look at those and mark the ones that pertain to you. At this time, uh, Judy and I are going to just talk to you a little bit about what's going on in the church, because there's lots of activity in, of late, and uh, we just wanted to give you a little bit of background about what is going on here and with new ministry that we are uh, embarking on. So, Judy? We began the launch program 2021, and Angela said it seems like longer ago than that because with COVID and everything, it seemed like we were interrupted. And anyway, but we went through it with, during COVID, I remember we were all wearing masks sitting around the room. And uh, um, it was a, a time of really deep, um, I don't even know how to describe it, but we left those meetings kind of exhausted, didn't we, Rachel? <laughs> it's, it was just a deep spiritual thinking and about where this church stands currently and what can we do about it. And, and uh, it's been a burden of this, of the launch team, and I'm sure of many of you out there, because if you look around, most of us are my age or thereabouts. And... Um, very few young families. And so as we prayed about where the Lord was taking us and what he would have us to do in this town and in this place, we, be, we got this real burden for young families and young people, um, millennials, as Angela would call them, um, 20, 18 to 40, young 40-ish. And um, it's so important that we begin to reach these people. It's a different culture out there, folks. It's not like when I grew up or when I became a Christian anymore. They think differently. Um, and um, Angela introduced us to a book recently called Welcoming the Future Church. And I was so impacted by some of the sobering statistics that they give about millennials. A lot of them are really... Um, they, they think about helping their fellow man, you know, they've got good hearts that way and so on, but 
um, when it comes to the relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, here are just a few, and these are American statistics, and I can't help but think Canadians are the same or perhaps even more so. 75% of them claim they are spiritual but not religious, meaning that they have no ties to anything other than spirituality. 68% say that more than one true, there is more than one true way to, in, to interpret the teachings of religion. 64% believe that sex outside of marriage is morally acceptable. 59% of millennial Christians disconnect from their church after the age of 15, either permanently or for an extended period of time. And I think we're seeing that lived out in our own fellowship. 50% believe that all people are eventually saved no matter what they do. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a backdrop of where, we're, where we've been coming from. And as Judy said, we were all pretty exhausted from going through the launch course. And I remember our last meeting, we all dreamed, we all discussed, we all analyzed, we all wanted to do something, but we didn't know what it was. And we've been waiting on the Lord to show us. And I don't know about you, but this summer it's been a stark reminder as I look around our church and saw fewer and fewer people sitting in our pews, and especially that demographic of millennials. And it just became clear. It just happened to be that I bought this book two years ago and hadn't cracked it open until this summer. And at Helen Hamilton's birthday party, Larry and Vanessa and I had an opportunity to sit together, and we were burdened for what's happening with our church. And Larry said, I've got a granddaughter and uh, her husband are very mission-minded. And they've been to Australia, they've been studying discipleship, they're millennials. And one of the things that came up in this book is how are you going to attract young adults if you don't have any in your congregation? And that that was really burdensome for us. And so we came together. We decided to start launch phase two. But now we're, we're going through phase two with, I believe, God's vision. And it's been really interesting to see how God has been working. That was one of the things that came up in the first launch course was joining God in your neighborhood where he's already working. And I think what we have seen in the last few weeks is God has been working things out for us. And it's been amazing as we sit with Kelsey and Josh. Really, they're a breath of fresh air. And to hear how God is aligning them for a ministry here. Now, a year ago, in the summertime, a few of us decided that it was time to purge the church of old furniture and things that needed to be cleaned up. And one of the things that, well, we had the big dumpster out back, we decided, well, we should just check on that carpet at the top of the stairs in the balcony, because it's been there since the 60s. And, well, we started tearing it up right at the top of the stairs. So we were committed at that time that the carpet had to come up. And we've always had in the back of our mind, if you've been there, if you grew up in this church, you know that the balcony has kind of a special place. And when you go up there, it's, uh, it's, you just see potential for ministry. So when Josh and Kelsey came our first day, we went up and they were like, yes, this is a perfect space. What we want is for Kelsey and Josh to have an opportunity to grow a ministry that they feel that God is calling them to here. And so what we'd like to do is develop the balcony as a cafe church and a place where young adults, single, married, can come and explore faith. Because what we know is young adults like to discuss. They like to not just be hearing a lecture, but they want to have opportunity to explore faith. And so that's what the vision is, is to develop the, the balcony as a spot where young adults can meet. Now, 
how are we going to do that? Because you probably looked at the bulletin and saw that we were $20,000 behind today. We're stepping out of the boat and we're asking you as a church to step out with us. We are stepping out in faith that the Lord is about to do a great work in this place. We're waiting on him. We don't want to rush ahead of him. We don't want to create the vision. We want his vision. And we want to be obedient in following him and what he's asking us to do. So as part of that, one of the things that the Canadian Baptist Association of Atlantic Canada has as their mission board is an opportunity to apply for a grant. We are applying for the grant on behalf of the church body. And what I need to let you know is next week after church, there'll be a short um, meeting for you to vote on, the, on our proposed grant before we send it off. And we're hoping to sustain enough funds to help us develop um, the balcony, to help pay for that, and to also help with some kind of an honorarium to help Kelsey and Josh, because right now they're living uh, down at Skiff Lake in, a, in one of the tiny homes. They're looking for land to move closer. We need to be praying for that, folks, that, that the Lord will uh, direct them to a, a piece of land that is perfect for them and that will help us in, in uh, joining and partnering with them in ministry here. There's so many things that we need you as church folks to be praying for. We need um, prayers that when we are writing this, this grant, that you will help, that God will inspire our thoughts in writing the grant. We need you as folks in our church to support fundraisers that we're going to do. And we all need to be just pulling in the same direction. And so we're asking you to be partnering with us with this new ministry. And there'll be more information next week. We'll have uh, hopefully our grant all written and ready um, so that if you have any questions about it, that you feel free to, to ask those questions. But it's an exciting time. And it's wonderful to see how God has been working in this past year when we didn't even realize it. So thank you for... Um, your time and listening to this this morning and I just uh, ask and covet your prayers for this new ministry. <clears throat> Could we have the ushers to come forward please for the offering? <laughs>
Well, good morning, everyone. Let's look to the Lord in prayer today and uh, be mindful not only of the needs that are in our hearts today, but there are many needs of those in our community, and we want to keep them in mind this morning as well. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have in our country to come and sing about our great God. Lord, we think of brothers and sisters in Christ today around the world who didn't have this freedom but had to meet in secret. And Lord, we just pray that you would continue to uh, work in our world in a way where your name is glorified, where souls are saved, where homes are put back together, where those who have walked away return. Lord, uh, we've come today after a busy week of work, of life, of much stress, and I pray that as we gather this morning that you would help us to just lay aside the things that are concerning our hearts so that we might focus on you. Lord, there are those in our community who have suffered the loss of loved ones this week, some of those, Lord, very much unexpected. And so, Lord, would you just reach out to them today and bring the comfort that we know our God of comfort can bring. Lord, there are those in our community today who are lacking work. And we pray, Lord, that you might supply their deeds according to your riches. There are those today in our community who feel hopeless and helpless and are at the end of their rope. And I pray today, Lord, that they might find encouragement, that they might realize that they do matter, and that they may understand that there's a God who loves them, even if they don't feel loved by anyone else. And Lord, we pray for our country today, and we pray for its leadership, that you might help them to, to pass rules and laws that would allow us to continually and freely worship the name of Jesus. Lord, we think of Heartland Baptist today, and we thank you for the good work that you are doing. We thank you for Josh and for Kelsey and for their heart for ministry. And Lord, we know that you are able to do all things. God, you are big enough to supply the needs before a grant is ever applied for. So we pray that if that's your will, that's what you would do. And Lord, just as ministry goes forth in this place... Lord, that you would touch the hearts of the people of the community with the wonderful love of Jesus Christ. And help us, Lord, to do our part, to be involved in your work. And as we come to your word today, Lord, would you help us to open our eyes, as the psalmist said, that we might behold wonderful truth therein. Lord, I am unworthy of standing for these people today. But you are worthy. So would you empty me of me and fill me with the Spirit. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be in Luke chapter 15 today. The Gospel of Luke in chapter 15. I titled the message today, The Other Prodigal. The other prodigal. This is a passage that has a lot of meaning to most of us. If we were to have a time of testimony, I would dare say that every one of us today has one, if not multiple people, that we dearly love, who like the prodigal son that we know, have gone away. And in, are currently living a life where they are wasting talent and money and all sorts of things on things that don't matter. And for those of us who have someone in our life like that, we come to this passage with a great sense of hope, don't we? I, I, I joke sometimes that we probably already have the fatted calf ready to go. <laughs> Just waiting for when that son or daughter or grandson or granddaughter, whoever that might be, maybe it's a spouse, comes back. To the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's another character that we often forget about in this parable. And for a few moments, I'd like for us to focus on him. 
the other prodigal. We're going to begin reading in verse 25. We'll read down to the end of the chapter, and then we'll go back to the beginning of the chapter and kind of work our way through. Now the older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. He said to him, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years have I served you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive, was lost and is found. The word prodigal means to spend wastefully. <laughs> it's, it's a word we know probably based just on this account from the scriptures. But to properly understand the argument of the Lord Jesus, we need to go back to the very beginning of chapter 15. And I want you to notice in verse number 1, he says, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So Jesus, as he continued to teach and as he continued to perform miracles, was drawing large crowds, but it wasn't the large crowds that maybe some would have expected. Tax collectors were some of the most hated people on the planet at that time, and they were coming. Not just Matthew, tax collectors, plural, were coming to listen to the teachings of Jesus. Sinners, those who were not living the right kind of life, those who were directly violating the commands of Scripture were coming not only to hear him, but listen, to eat with him. It's a little different story if we just see someone on the side of the street, but when we sit down and have a meal with someone, it, it constitutes the idea of intimacy, doesn't it? Jesus was eating with the reprobates, the tax collectors, and the sinners, and the spiritual people of the day, they weren't too happy about it. They weren't happy about it. So look at verse 3. So, it's connection. Based on the fact that they were murmuring and grumbling, the spiritual giants of the day were, this man is receiving sinners and he's eating with them, so he told them a parable. Based on their grumblings, he told them a parable. The first one is the parable of a lost sheep. We know the story, don't we? He, he says, which of you would not go and find your lost sheep? He goes on and he tells a parable of a lost coin in the same way. If you had lost some money, which of you wouldn't search hard to find it? And then he tells the parable of a lost son. A son who comes to his father and says, I want my inheritance now. And the father gives it to him and he goes off and he lives this horrible life. And he spends all of it and he's, he ends up with nothing. So he, he begins living literally amongst the pigs, and then in the midst of eating the food that the pigs eat, he comes to his senses and says, it would be better to be a slave in my father's house than to be here. And we know the story, don't we? He goes home, and the father sees him coming. And what does the father do? How dare he come back to my house after he did what he did with my money? That's not what happens, is it? The father runs to the son. What a picture of the grace of our God. He runs to the son and he puts all these, the best clothes and he gives him a ring and he says, get the best food we have. We are celebrating tonight because my son was lost and now he's found. And really, which of the Pharisees probably wouldn't have done the same thing? 
they would have gone after the lost sheep because it was valuable to them. They would have gone after the last coin because it was valuable to them. And Jesus said, this father went after his lost son when he came home because it was valuable to him. But then he gets to verse 25. And really, instead of answering the question, this man receives sinners and eats with them, and beginning in verse 25, he looks at the Pharisees, and I think is asking the question, why aren't you? They were murmuring and complaining about Jesus sitting with sinners. And he's just letting them know I'm just going after what's lost. But the older son is often forgotten. And I would put forward today that I believe he was just as wasteful as the brother we know, just in a different way. I, I want to warn you as I unpack this this morning, this passage, beginning in verse 25, it's for those of us who go to church faithfully. This passage is not for those who struggle with running from God, but maybe condemn those who are. So what does Jesus teach us in the life of the older brother, the other prodigal? I want you to notice something about this, this child. Now, the older son, verse 25, was in the field. He comes home from a hard day's work, and what does he hear? He hears music and dancing. So he asks one of the servants. He doesn't even go in to investigate. I think in his heart, he probably knows what's going on. He calls the servant and says, what's going on? The servant says, your brother has come home, and your father is throwing a great celebration but he was angry, and he refused to go in. Look what, he, what happens. His father came to him and entreated him, and he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends, but when this son of yours... Came. You've done this. Notice how he talks about his relationship with his father differently than his brother's relationship with his father. I have served you. Word there is bond servant. You've been in church many times <laughs> over the years to know that's the bond slave word. What does he see his relationship with his father as? Just somebody who's serving his dad. No. He's my master, and I'm his servant. I'm his slave. And then he says, and I've done everything you've commanded me to do. Same concept, isn't it? I'm here, I'm your slave, and I'm doing everything you tell me to do. Is that wrong necessarily? It's not wrong to be obedient. But this was his father, not a master. This was his dad, not some guy who pays him at the end of the day. He was missing out, was he not, on some intimacy with his own father. He was missing out on, on his father's presence. His father says, son, you've always been with me. Son. <laughs> He doesn't say servant. The father saw him as a son. But the son didn't see his dad as a father. And as a result, spent years in his father's house not enjoying a relationship with his father. He missed provision. His father says, everything I have is yours. If you wanted a fatted calf, you could have had one any day of any week. 
You just had to ask for it. But he never did. Because he didn't see that relationship with his father as a son-father relationship. That guy's just my master, and I'm just doing what he tells me to do. I have this duty to perform, but my heart's really not there. I'm your slave. But Jesus said, (laughs) he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus didn't come to be served. He came to serve. The Pharisees and the scribes couldn't see that because they had a different mindset. Some might say, well, the older brother has a legitimate complaint here. And I would say, you're not getting the image here. He was missing out on the presence of his father. He was missing out on the provision of his father because he had the wrong idea of the relationship. Has God ever done something for somebody else? And the first thought in your mind just kind of go, what about me here? I've missed a day at church 16 years. Where's my big check coming in the mail? Have you ever had that thought? Maybe you didn't verbalize it, but there are times in our hearts when we feel that, don't we? Somebody who's been not in church for years, who's run away from God, comes back, and all of a sudden they're celebrated because of the amazing grace of Jesus that has rescued them out of the miry clay and set their feet on a rock. And we rejoice in their great salvation. But some of us kind of go, what about us? We've been here the whole time. Just like the brother. Where's my celebration? Why don't I get carted up in front of the church to give my testimony about how I came to Jesus? Because we do that, don't we? Oh, man. The alcoholic. He's out of alcohol. He's gotten saved. Let's, Let's... Share his testimony, and and as we should, praise God for that victory. And sometimes those of us who haven't ever got to share our testimony kind of go, I guess my life doesn't matter to the Father. I would dare say that we can be very guilty of the same heart as this older brother. Where we miss out on that powerful truth that God is always with us and everything God has is yours. Ephesians says it this way, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Every spiritual blessing, every one of them. And you may have come in here today going, that's not how I feel in my heart today. And I get that because I've been there. And I'll probably be there at some point, either today or tomorrow or the next day. If I go outside today and I look up in the sky and I can see the sun, praise God. But if I go up and it's rainy and it's cloudy and I can't see it, does that mean the sun's not there? Still there, isn't it? There's just something in the way that's causing me to not be able to see it. And oftentimes that's the way it is with those spiritual blessings. They're all there. But life gets in the way, and the stress of my job gets in the way, and the fact that my kids don't want anything to do with Jesus gets in the way, and I don't see all that God is trying to do in my life. We don't always see all that God is trying to do in our church. He was angry because God showed grace. Because his dad showed grace to his brother, he got angry. You know, sometimes we do the same. We may not throw a pity party outside, but there are times in our life where we wonder, why is God blessing them and not me? Interesting how he saw himself 
as a servant who obeys. And when he looks at his brother, he saw him as a son. Your son came home. And his dad looks at him and says, son. You see, he received the older prodigal the same way he received the younger, didn't he? What an amazingly gracious man. A son who wasted everything comes home and he throws a celebration. And a son who went out and acted like a four-year-old and sucked his thumb, what does he do? Instead of looking at him and condemning him, probably with tears in his eyes, he looks at his son and says, Son, I'm right here. And everything that I have is yours. It was a good thing that I did this for your brother. But you've missed out. Because that was always available for you. Are we missing out? Are we so used to just coming and doing the Sunday morning routine? Are we missing out on a genuine, intimate relationship with our Father? Are we missing out on the provisions that God has? Because we're just busy going through the motions. A number of years ago, someone took one of my favorite songs of all time and put a little twist on it. The song is Amazing Grace. We've probably all sung it 4,000 times. Maybe more than that. But all of a sudden, it carried an impact. Because I had sung that song so many times, it really wasn't amazing anymore. But then all of a sudden, someone said this, my chains are gone. I've been set free. And I remember the first time I heard that, I felt the overwhelming grace of Jesus all over again and I sat there amazed for the first time in a long time at his grace are we guilty of that sometimes where we sing and we know what to do in this Christian life so much that we're missing out and I want you to see what the father does here there's, there's really five things the first thing the father does to this disgruntled son, this angry son, is he can't, comes to him. Just like he did with the younger son. He didn't wait for the younger son to make it all the way home, did he? What happened? He ran. What happened the moment he heard his older son was struggling? He went right to him. That's what our God does, doesn't he? He's always coming toward us he's not waiting around hoping we'll make that decision he's always coming to meet with us the father came out he came to the son not only did he come out the Bible says he entreated him he came out and he entreated him he started having a conversation with him he doesn't come out swinging. He doesn't come out laying down the law. He comes out and starts to reason with his son. Now, as a father, he has some rights, doesn't he? As a father, to be able to say some things to his son. Any dad in here knows what I'm talking about. When your kids were in your house still, there were some rules that dad had and you didn't break them, right? He had the right to speak to his son that way, but he doesn't. He comes out and he starts to reason with the son. He shows the son his heart. The father's not trying to get the son to perform the right action. The father's trying to get the son to have the right heart. He doesn't just come out and say, you better get in there and start dancing, boy, or else. He comes for his heart. 
He entreats him. And then he says this. Son, my child, not my servant, not my slave, my son. The Greek literally means child. The son says, I have been serving you. I have been obeying you. I have been doing everything you told me to do. And the father just simply says, my son. I don't think if the father had come out and said, started arguing the whole, yeah, you've not been serving me like you think you have, child. Or you haven't, remember last Thursday when I told you to do this and you didn't really do it? You haven't really obeyed everything I've said. That wouldn't have gotten anywhere. He just comes out, and after the son says his piece, he says, my son, child, this relationship going on and behind us in my house is the relationship that you should have with me, that I long to have with you. And what's the essence of that relationship? You are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. You are my son. I am your father. I have always been here. And that's the void of the son's heart. He lived in his father's house. He worked in his father's fields. He he obeyed his father's commands. He he says, you've never given me a, a goat that I can go have a celebration with. And the father says, I've been here the whole time. You've been here the whole time. And everything that is mine is yours. In a couple of ways. Remember, oldest son got the the lion's share, right? That's the way this happened in culture. He was getting everything. It was literally all his. But his father was also saying, take anything you want. Because all I really want is you. Many people today hear the words, you are always with me, and it it doesn't mean anything. Is God the treasure of our heart? Have the party, have the goat, have whatever you want. Everything that's mine is yours. I believe at this point, (laughs) Jesus is not looking at the eyes of the sinners and the tax collectors that he's eating with. I think he looks up from them and he looks right directly into the eyes of the Pharisees. Because they were missing out, weren't they? The religious people of the day looked in the eyes of their Savior and put them on a cross. They missed out. They got upset about all the wrong things, didn't they? To the point where they executed his crucifixion. They were upset because he was rescuing people who needed to be rescued. And he looks out at them and he says, Boys, I'm ever with you. And everything I have is yours. You just got to come to me like the son, the younger son came to him. Stop coming to me out of a sense of duty and come to me as a child in need of a father. And you'll find a father who desperately loves his child. But you can stay out here on the porch and you can sulk and you can murmur and you can complain and you can be angry Or you can come in and be my son and enjoy the fact that another one of my sons has come home. 
Jesus is entreating the Pharisees. <laughs> you guys don't get it, do you? Sitting with sinners, that's the whole point. <laughs> Reaching the lost, that's all. You guys would go for a sheep, wouldn't you? You'd go for a coin, wouldn't you? But when you see me going after souls, you get upset. You miss the point. I'm here. And everything I have is available to you and to anyone who wants it. You just have to come. You see, the first son wasted everything away by spending it all. And the older son wasted it by not using it at all. He was just as guilty, wasn't he? One took it all, threw it out. The other one, I don't need any of that. And then got upset about the fact that he didn't use it. Everything that God has is yours. Come. Come. God offers us grace today. Amazing grace. And some of us here today think of our prodigals. And our hearts break for them. And we long for the day that they return to worship with us in a place like Heartland Baptist Church. But there might be some today online or some here today who are much like the older brother. Looking down our noses at other people. Not taking advantage of the relationship God longs for us to have with him. I remember the first time I saw this in this passage. Kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. It's a passage I have to come back to over and over and over again. Because I know I'm going to go to work this week in my own strength. Instead of the strength of my father. And I know I'm going to try to parent my kids someday without his grace. And I'll fail miserably. And I know there is so much more that I can have in my relationship with the Lord Jesus each and every day. I've got a lot left to learn. And I love hearing the stories of prodigals coming home. But I love just as much when the rest of us prodigals get up out of our church pews and say, God, I'm missing out, and I'm sorry, and I want to be your child the way I'm supposed to be. It's just as exciting, isn't it? What is God offering you today that you're missing out on? Don't you dare give up on your prodigals. Because our God is big enough to bring them all home. But make sure while we're praying for our prodigals, we're not becoming prodigals ourselves. Being wasteful of the relationship God wants us to have with him. By not asking him for the provisions he's promised to provide. Son... You are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. Father, I thank you for this day. Forgive me, Lord, for how often my heart wastes a relationship with you. Thank you for reminding me this week. That I need you every moment of every day. And that you're right there and you're longing to have that relationship with me. Lord, help me to enjoy your presence the way I should. To ask for your provision and understand it's available the way you have promised. Lord, help me to not murmur, not complain. Not be upset when others receive your grace. When I'm missing out on grace each and every day. 
open my eyes, Lord, so that I might see the importance of a relationship with Jesus every day. Thank you for the story of the prodigal son. And thank you for using his brother in my life. Help me not to be the other prodigal. Help us all this week to work on our relationship with you. That we would understand you're with us. And you're not going anywhere. Even when we turn, you're right there with us. Coming to us. Longing to, to plead with us to enjoy your presence in our daily lives. And help us, Lord. Help us to be children of God. Not servants and slaves of God, but children of God who serve you out of a heart of love, not out of a heart of duty. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for that amazing grace. And truly, Lord, everything we have is because of your amazing grace. Lord, help us to understand that in a deeper way today. Help us to depend upon your grace each and every day this week. And Lord, as we go our separate ways today, Lord, help us to understand that you're with us. And help us to take your name and your grace and share it with our community this week through word, through, through deed, Lord, through our giving. Help people in our community to know that we are the church and we are in love with Jesus by how we work and how we live and how we speak. And Lord, might you bring us back together next week so that we can celebrate how your amazing grace got us through. So dismiss us, Lord, with your blessing. And we pray it now in Jesus' name, amen.